As we begin this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we are preparing our hearts to hear from you this morning, Jesus, you are all we need. Jesus, you are enough. You are everything. And none of us can ever number the blessings that you have blessed us with because you bless us with every blessing from heavenly places. And Father, I pray that as we dive into your word this morning, the truth of your word would land on our hearts and from our hearts would proceed from our mouth so that we will be your witnesses into all the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in our series, Distracted. It's the devil's device to conquer the Christian's effectiveness. The devil can't have us because Jesus has us if we've placed our faith in him. But he knows that if he can distract us, he can win a battle in our lives. And so as we move through this series, we need to constantly go back to our focal passage, which is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. And those verses are something that we need to memorize, we need to internalize, and we need to apply to our life. Cast all of your cares, cast all of your concerns, cast all of your anxieties, cast all of your distractions on him because he cares for you. Aren't you glad that Jesus cares for you this morning? He cares enough for you that you can give him anything that's going on in your life, including the distractions in our life. And then he gives us the why which is because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, Satan wants to sift us like wheat, as Jesus told Peter. Satan wants to beat the brakes off of the Christians. And so we need to be on constant watch, constant concern, constant cares, constant worries, and give them to Jesus because Jesus can protect us from anything that Satan throws our way. And folks, I don't know about you, but I'm a distractible creature. I can get distracted in a New York second. And we all have those problems in our lives, but we can give those to Jesus. This morning, as we begin this sermon, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1. And we're going to begin in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 18 to 25. And the reason that I'm going to do this this morning is I'm starting off in Romans to bring something to our attention. But as we go through this message, some of you like to take notes. And if you like to take notes, there's going to be a lot of scripture in this message this morning. And when I say a lot, a whole lot more than I normally use, because we're going to use a lot of passages that you can go back to, that you can use, and, and you can put in your gun when we go into spiritual battle. So you'll need to write these down because I'm going to go through a lot of them quickly. And the reason I'm doing that is because I am part of a pastor's Facebook page and they send out encouraging things and they send out challenging things. And so as I was reading this week, I came across this and it was a, le a note to the preacher from another preacher. And it simply said this, dear preacher, as you prepare for the pulpit, please give us less jokes and stories and more Bible, less psychology and more scripture. Less self-help and more self-denial. Less coaching and more anointing. Less eisegesis and more exegesis. And for those of you who may not know what that is, more, less of reading into the text what, so, what your own ideas are and more critical explanation of the text. Less of you and more of Christ. And that's my prayer this morning, is that as we come together that I'll preach the word and you won't even know that I've been up here, but you'll hear from God. This morning, as we begin in our text in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, notice what the apostle is writing the church in Rome. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all un ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and his Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because all they, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile or became useless or ineffectual in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changing the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like incorruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Notice verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Verse 25 is what I want you to focus in on. If you underline in your Bible, underline this first line. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. If you read that, if you hear that and you pay attention to that, doesn't it sound like where we live today? People have exchanged the truth of God for the lie. They've exchanged what God has put in place. And the one thing that just grabs me when I read this passage, every time I read this passage, is the phrase where Paul says, they are without excuse. We were created in the image of God. We are created to understand that God exists, yet man in his infinite foolishness tries to think that I know more, I know better than God. This morning, as we dive into this message, it's just simply titled, Distracted by Deception. Distracted by Deception. And because of that that phrase that Paul puts in there, they exchange the truth for the lie. And one of Satan's ploys, one of Satan's biggest tools is the fact that he can deceive someone. Did you know that Satan is the ultimate liar and the originator of lies? Satan came up with lying. And so he uses that as he uses that deception as a tool to try to trick us into believing something that is not the truth of God. And so as we look at these passages this morning, I want you to think of it in lines of Satan is the ultimate deceiver. In John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus said these words, "You are of your father the devil." He's speaking to this religious group and he says, listen, guys, you may think you're religious. You may think that you know the the word of God, but you are of your father, the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. Imagine how they how they heard that. He just called us sons of the devil. Then notice how he describes the enemy. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan's one of his biggest tools that he'll use is deception because he is a liar. He created lies. Satan has filled this world with lies and the world is buying into them wholeheartedly. Satan is putting lies out in front of us. He's putting the lies out in front of the entire world. We live in a world where it takes, we, we, you better be cautious and you better take care to discern the lies from the truth. And this is why, this is why Adolf Hitler was quoted as saying this, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it'll be believed. Think about what happens in the news media. Think about what happens all around us every day. People are spewing lies at us. And if you tell it enough, if you tell it often enough, people are going to say, well, it must, there must be some truth in that. And they'll just walk away from it. Satan has used lies since the dawn of time. Do you remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden and Satan saw Eve looking at the fruit that God told her not to eat? And he just simply said these words, and I'm paraphrasing here. God didn't say you would really die. What did God tell him? If you eat of that tree, you're going to die. 
But Satan, he twisted it just enough. You're not physically going to die on the spot. It's not poisonous. It's not going to kill you right now. But what Eve didn't understand was the truth that God told her was this an eternal death. And Satan was just trying to make her think it was a physical death. So from the dawn of time, he's used, he's used lies to deceive. Satan uses the lie to dilute the truth just enough that people can't see the deception. He's going to dilute it down just enough. And can even, that can even flow into the Christian circles, into the Christian way of thinking. And we've got to be careful because we'll hear these things and say, well, it sounds almost like the truth. So it must have a little truth in it. We better be on guard and we better be grounded in the truth and we better be governed by the Holy Spirit or we'll fall for the deception of Satan. We need to have the truth in us. Adam and Eve walked with God, physically walked with God in the garden every single evening. And they didn't see the lie. So we better be on guard. We better be grounded in, in the truth, which is his word. And we better let the Holy Spirit govern our minds and our hearts. Today, I want to speak to you on a post that's been floating around on Facebook. And I've seen it everywhere, and some of you may have even shared it. And these are some, some things that the enemy is trying to use to condition our thinking. And what he's doing is he says, you know, just look at these, and they sound really good, but they're not the truth. They're not the truth. Remember, a lie that's told often enough will be believed as the truth. We need to heed the words of Paul that we find in Philippians chapter 4. We need to make sure that we have this printed on our heart, stamped in our mind. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think intensely on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me these do, and the God of peace will be with you. We better be cautious about what we're thinking on, what we're paying attention to, and what we're meditating on to make sure that it's the things of God so that the deception of Satan will not affect our way of thinking. So this morning, I want to give you six lies. Six lies that are taken as the truth in the world in which we live in. So if you want to just, just, just listen and, and write notes, it's going to be hard to turn to a lot of these passages of Scripture. Some of them will be on the screen. Most of them will just be the references. So let's just jump in. The first lie is this. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. This is the cry of the day. Now I want to tell you why this is a lie. And what they do is they say, follow your heart. If, if you feel like it, just do it. Don't, you know, do what your heart desires. Don't deny yourself what you want. Here's the thing. Here's the truth. And it's found in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So if you want to, if you want to say, follow your heart, you're following something that's desperately wicked. And you don't know where your heart's going to lead you. That's a lie. Straight from the mouth of Satan. Don't follow your heart. Jesus, 13 times in the New Testament, instructs us not to follow our heart, but to follow him. 13 times in the New Testament, Jesus doesn't say, follow your heart. If that's what you want to do, just go for it. He doesn't say that. He says, follow me. Follow me. So Satan says, you just follow your heart. You do what you want to do. But Jesus says, no, that's not what it is. You follow me. If we follow our heart, I guarantee you heartache's coming. Heartache's right around the corner. If you follow your heart, it's going to lead you down the wrong path because the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what the scripture says. Here's the thing. Because many have followed their hearts, because many have, have taken this lie as the truth and they followed their own heart, marriages have been destroyed. Lives have been affected by substance abuse. Teen pregnancies have happened. Families have been devastated. Don't follow your heart. That's a lie from the pits of hell. You follow Jesus. He tells us over and over in his word, follow me, follow me. He has never failed and he will never fail. 
If we put our faith in Christ and we follow Christ and don't follow our heart, we're going to be right where he wants us to be. Don't fall for the lie that Satan's telling to follow your heart. Uh, The second lie is this. It kind of goes with the first one. Be true to you. Be true to you. It doesn't matter about anyone else. It doesn't matter what anybody else wants. Being true to you is to say without saying, I'm selfish and it's all about me. Being true to you is saying without saying, I am all that matters. It's saying, I am the center of my universe. And folks, if you stop for just a second and let your mind start thinking, you'll see that's what's happening in the world around us. I'm just going to be true to me. I'm just going to be true to me. It doesn't matter what happens to anybody else. I'm going to be true to me. But what about what God says in his word? Here's some scriptures that you can write down and that you can go back to and listen to. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says this, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only on your own interest, but also on the interest of others. Scripture says just the opposite of being true to you. It says, you take care of others. Look at others more highly than you look at yourself. Take care of their interests. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 says, Let not your conduct or let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. If we're to stand together in one mind, if we're to stand together in, in one spirit, That means we can't be out to be true for you. We can't be true to ourselves. We have to see that we're part of the body of Christ. Being true to you is to live contrary to what the Bible tells us to live. To look out for others. Being true to you is to go against what Jesus has saved us to be. Being true to you is a lie straight from the mouth of Satan himself because in Matthew chapter 16 verses 24 through 26 Jesus tells us then Jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me for whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's not about being true to you, but denying you and following Jesus. Satan wants to tell us, it's all about you. Don't worry about anybody else. It's all about you. But Jesus says, no, it's about denying yourself. It's all about me. The third lie that we see this morning is this. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Now, this is not to say, and it's not speaking about confidence in our ability. This is a conceited way of thinking, meaning I believe that it's all about me. I believe in me. This goes beyond believing in what you can do or something that you can do. We all have the ability to be confident in some things that we're gifted to do. But this is going to the beyond confidence and going to conceit. This is saying that I am the center of my universe. I am the one that makes everything happen in my life. I'm the one. I don't need anyone else in my life. I can do this. This is a self-confidence that leads us to believe that you are all you need in life. I don't know about you, but I know that if I was all I needed in life, I'd be in bad shape. Jesus is all we need in this life. The Bible speaks to the mindset of believing in yourself. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 5 says this, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. Listen, I love a lot of you guys. I love all of you, as a matter of fact. But I'm not going to put my trust in any of you. I love you, but my trust is going to be in Jesus, not in man. And the Bible says, cursed is the man who trusts, or cursed is the man who trusts in man. So if this is believe in yourself, 
That's telling me that if I, if, if, I, if I follow that lie, that I'm cursed. Psalm chapter 146, verse 3 says, Do not put trust in princes, nor in, the son of, in, in, in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Here's one for you. Brother Floyd, you read this the other day. I'm going to give it to you. Jeremiah, or Isaiah chapter 31, verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. And rely on horses who trust in chariots because there are many, because they are many. And in horsemen because they are very strong. But who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. If you say, I believe in myself, that's saying, Jesus, I don't need you. If you say you believe in you, it's saying, Jesus, I don't, there's no room for you in my life because I've got this. Satan wants all of us to believe that lie. This is what Jesus says concerning the subject of belief. Not belief in yourself, but belief in him. In John chapter 6, verse 29, Jesus answered them and said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Believe in Jesus. John chapter 6, verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and who, he who believes in me shall never thirst. John 14, verse 1. Let, your, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is saying, it's not about believing in you. It's not about believing in man. It's about believing in me. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. If you place your belief in a man, your life will be forfeit. If you place your faith in Jesus, you're going to have life eternal. Belief in him. Belief in yourself will lead to destruction in hell. Belief in Jesus will lead to eternal life. Satan says, believe believe in yourself. Don't believe in Jesus. Believe in yourself. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Satan says, just believe in you. Believe in you. You don't need to believe in Jesus. Belief in Jesus is the only help the world needs. Belief in his finished work on the cross. I'm going to stand where Paul stood. I can do all things Through Christ who strengthens me. My belief is in him. There's a fourth lie that I want us to look at this morning. And if it's true for you, then it must be true. How many times do we hear this around us in the world today? If it's true for you, it must be true. This mindset is known as relativism. And relativism is simply to say this. There is no absolute truth. If I believe it's true, so be it. It's the truth. You can believe your way. I'll believe my way. We're both true. I got news for you. There's only one truth. There's only one truth. You can't, you can't say something's true and I can't say something's true. So one of us has got to be lying. There's only one truth. This is to say that there's no absolute truth. This is a lie that the only truth is what you see is true. We can't create truth. There's no way that you can create truth in your life. But you can believe in the truth. And you can know the truth. There are some that will lead people into a false truth. The Bible speaks to these. And it's this. Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We live in a day that we've got a lot of false prophets that come looking like the sheep, but they're leading sheep astray, and they're leading sheep to destruction. I posted something on Facebook last night that every one of us need to keep going out there and keep sending out there because it's a picture-perfect example of this verse. There's a book that's in our school systems right now that are on the preferred reading list, and the kids can get it, and the kids can read it, and they're encouraging it. And the name of the book sounds awesome. It's called Conversations with God. Doesn't that sound like a good book for our kids to read? However, this is a wolf in sheep's clothing because the author of this book is speaking for God and speaking on behalf of God and speaking as God in this book. 
And just to give you a small example, one of the girls, one of the questions that was asked in the book, a little girl says, I'm a lesbian and I'm scared to let people know because I don't know, I don't know what they'll think about me. And he said, it doesn't matter what they think about you. You just be you. And this is God speaking to this little girl. I got news for you. That goes against this book and that book needs to be thrown away. That, that book is out there, and that is, is, you know, we need to fill up our Facebook post with that saying, listen, this is dangerous. Parents, don't let your kids read a book called Conversation with God because it is straight from the lying mouth of Satan himself. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. That's what Satan wants to do. We better be on guard. We better be grounded in the word, and we better be governed by the Holy Spirit, knowing what God's word says, or we can be deceived by these lying tongues. But I want you to hear this clearly. If you don't hear anything else, here is the ultimate truth. Psalm 25, verse 5, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. God is truth. Jesus is truth. Psalm 145, verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. John chapter 16, verse 13, whoever... However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Folks, with Christ in our life, we have the Holy Spirit as our conscience and our guide. And he will guide us into the truth of God's word. We need to make sure that we stay in God's word for the Holy Spirit to lead us in that truth. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God's word is the ultimate truth. God's word is the only truth. What's true for you does not matter. What God said is the only truth that matters. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And then Jesus, the ultimate authority in my life, and I pray he's the ultimate authority in your life. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is our ultimate truth. It doesn't matter what you think is true, because it may not be true, unless you are placing your total faith, and trust in the truth that is Jesus. Lie number five, do what makes you happy. Do what makes you happy. Is there anybody in here that doesn't want to be happy? We all want to be happy. We all want to walk around with a smile on our face, but we live in a world that happiness can be an illusion. And a lot of times happiness is an illusion. Here's the problem with this lie. Happiness is an emotion. Happiness is an emotion that comes from within us. And here's the problem. It is a sense that all is well in our world. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but emotions can lie. Our emotions, we can tell ourselves we're happy and we can put a smile on our face, but there could be something down deep in us that is not happy. When we make the decision based on what we think will make us happy, despair is right around the corner when happiness doesn't come. And a lot of people try to place their place their their feelings and they they try to place their uh, their life on things that will make them happy. This, This if I had this, it'll make me happy. If I do this, it'll make me happy. People seek happiness in things that the world offers. Then they find the happiness in things and stuff, and then when things and stuff are gone, so goes the happiness. Do what makes you happy. As a believer, I want, to, I want you to learn a new word. And that is, as a believer in Christ, we need to seek joy and not happiness. 
We need to seek joy and not ha happiness is a byproduct of an inner joy that we have. When we have the inner joy that is Jesus, happiness is a byproduct. Joy is not an emotion. Joy is a state of being because you can be joyful in the darkest times in your life. When you're going through the worst things that you've ever gone through, you can still have an inner joy. You're not happy about it, but you've got an inner joy knowing that Jesus is with you every step of the way. True joy only comes from a relationship with Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, Jesus is speaking. He says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What if we're seeking happiness and that's all we seek? What do we stand to gain? Billy Graham wrote something on this topic that I want to share with you that hopefully will help bring it into Clarity. He wrote this. Many people think that being happy and being joyful are the same thing, but there's a difference. We experience a sense of happiness when our circumstances are pleasant and we're relatively free from troubles. The problem, however, is that this kind of happiness is fleeting and superficial. When circumstances changes, when circumstances change as they inevitably do, then this kind of happiness evaporates like the early morning fog in the heat of the sun. Even when our inward circumstances are seemingly ideal, we still may be troubled inside by a nagging hunger or longing for something we cannot identify. We say that we're happy, but down inside we know that it's only temporary and shallow at best. Even from time to time, we may think we have found a degree of happiness, but it eventually vanishes. That kind of happiness that's lasting, or the kind of happiness that's lasting is an inner joy and peace which endures any circumstances, no matter what may come our way. It may even grow stronger in adversity. This kind of happiness to which Jesus summons to us in his sermon of the Beatitudes, he alone has the answer to our search for lasting happiness. He who heeds the word of God wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Proverbs 16, verse 20. Happiness can disappear in a New York second. Joy will last through eternity. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. You know this passage very well. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now let's go back. Blessed, that word blessed in the Hebrew literally means happy. Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, and that word delight, in the Hebrew, means joy. But his joy is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Are we seeking happiness that can be deceptive? Or are we seeking joy that will last for eternity? The last lie <clears throat> that I want to mention this morning is this. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Now, there is some truth in that. There is some truth in that statement. Becoming a Christian is by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. It's in the, placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. When we place our faith through the, through the drawing of the Holy Spirit, and we repent of our sins, and we surrender our life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are saved. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. End of, end of discussion. But Satan wants to throw this at us. He says, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I want to, talk to speak to that for just a moment. Many people want a ticket to heaven and just ride out their time on earth with no obligations to change and doing their own thing. I want to say a little prayer. I want to get a little wet. But I want to live my life like I'm used to living it. Folks, I'm telling you, if that's the mindset, nothing has happened in your heart. 
when Jesus enters somebody, it's a transformational change in that person. When you invite Christ to come into your heart, things change. Paul says it so eloquently when he says, the old is gone and the new has come. When we have Christ in our life, we're not what we used to be. We're not what we're going to be, but we're working toward that. And we want to have Christ in our life. There's got to be some change. Some don't want to be bothered with having church interfere with their plans. This is a big lie that Satan wants everyone to believe. Remember, saving faith is a transforming faith. If you're a Christian and you have Christ in your life, there's going to be a desire to be with other Christians. There's going to be a desire to be part of the church, not, to, not out of obligation, because, but simply because we are part of the body of Christ. Here's the thing. When I wake up on Sunday morning, the first thing that goes through my mind is not, man, I have got to go spend time with those people again. That's not what goes through my mind. What goes through my mind is I get to go spend time with them again because contrary to what anybody may think, we're family in Christ. When Christ saved us, we become part of the family of God. And I want to spend time with you because you're my family. I have that desire in my heart. And the reason I have that desire is not because something that I can muster up on my own. It's because Christ has done a transforming work in my life. And I want to be around other believers. I want to spend time with other believers. We all know Hebrews 10 verses 24 and 25. It says, do not or let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. The only way that we can stir each other up as we see the day of Christ approaching is we've got to be together to stir each other up. We've got to come together. We need to be together. We need to spend time together. And we better do that more and more the closer it comes to Christ's return. Because we need to be encouraging each other. We need to be stirring each other up. Did you know that Jesus gives us an example of being together in church? In, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, is speaking, he's speaking of Jesus. It says, so he came to Nazareth, talking about Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Jesus said, I'm going back to Nazareth. I'm going to church. I'm going to be with, my, I'm going to be with the other ones that believe in me. I'm going to spend time with those who are part of my family. Here's the thing. We can't do Colossians 3.16 if we're not together. Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Now, I can do that on my own while I'm driving down the road in my truck. Some people have looked at me cross-eyed because they saw me in there just to singing as loud as I could sing. But we can't do this for each other. Did you know what it said? Did you catch what it says? Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. We have to be together in order to do that. We have to come together in corporate worship. We worship in, in song. We worship in giving. We worship in the word. We come together to stir each other up. And if I came in here on Sunday morning and there was nobody in here but me, I couldn't do this. I could get up here and talk all morning long but I'm not stirring anyone up. In order for us to do that, we have to come together. There's been a Facebook uh, post floating around for some months now, and it's using some of Tony Evans' quotes. And I want to share this with you this morning. And it simply says this. This is from, from Dr. Tony Evans. It says, The Christians are, not, are being cultural and not biblical, and this will bring God's judgment. We want to live like the culture instead of living what the Bible says. The Bible says we're to be together. We're to gather together. We're to come together even more as the day is approaching. So we're being more cultural than biblical. Then he goes on to say, this will bring God's judgment. Then he says this. Some Christians say that they do not have to go to church to be a Christian. And I love this part. You don't have to go home at night if you're married either. But the relationship is in serious trouble if you don't. 
Did you catch that? You can say, I don't have to come to church. If I'm a Christian, I don't have to come to church. You know, you don't have to come to church. However, your relationship will be in serious trouble if you don't. So let's wrap this up this morning. We need to take heed to the words in Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10, which says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. Did you catch that? The heart is deceitful. Who can know it? But the Lord searches our heart. He tests our mind. And he's going to give to us according to the fruit that we produce. But if we take heed to Jeremiah, then Romans 15, 13 will be present in our life. Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of deception, and he wants to distract us by deception. Don't be distracted by Satan. Don't believe the lie. And in order for us to be where we need to be, we need to pay attention to what we're paying attention. We need to understand that the lies are all around us, and we better be grounded in the truth, or the deception can happen even in the life of the believer. We need to set boundaries and constraints against the lies of this world. We need to make sure those lies are not coming into the the ears and the minds of our children. We need to set those boundaries, set those constraints. We need to set our minds on things above. We need to set our mind on the truth that is God's word and the truth that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Let's bow together as we close this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. The dangerous thing about what we talked about this morning is this. Some of us can buy into these lies because we're not guarding ourselves, we're not grounding ourselves in the Word, and we're not being governed by the Holy Spirit. What are some of the lies that you've allowed yourself to believe? What are some of these things that you may be battling? in with the truth have you been deceived I want to tell you this morning there's hope and that hope is grounding yourself in the word of God guarding yourself from the deception of the enemy and letting your life be governed by the Holy Spirit It's my prayer that everyone in this room is a follower of Jesus Christ. It's my prayer that you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. But are you grounded in the Word? Are you guarding your mind and your heart against the lies of the enemy? Here's where we need to be. Pay attention to what you're paying attention. Set those constraints and those boundaries and focus on the things that are above, which are the truth. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, but God does. I don't know what some in your family may be dealing with, but God does. This morning, as we come to this time that we call the invitation, I'm inviting you to spend time with God to get things right that you may need to get right in your life. There may be some in here this morning that's been deceived by Satan because he's telling you you don't need Christ. You may be here this morning and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus. So you can't, you can't guard against the lie because you have no power in and of yourself. If you're here this morning and you can't say, Preacher, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I died today, that I would go to heaven. Come and let me pray with you. Let me talk to you so that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have Christ in your life. But believer, these lies are all around us. And when these lies are all around us, there's a battle to be fought. 
Are you guarding? Are you grounded? And are you being governed by the Holy Spirit? Today's the day to make sure that's where it needs to be. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and sing. And these altars are open if you need to come. Father, I thank you for your word. A lot of your word was spoken this morning. and Father, your word is truth. Jesus, you are the truth, the life and the way. Father, I pray that each believer in this room would not be deceived by the deception of the enemy. Father, the lies that are around us, I pray that we wouldn't fall prey to them, that we would hold fast to the truth. Father, help us to guard against these lies. Father, give us the desire to be more grounded in your word, which is truth. And Holy Spirit, govern our lives because you lead us in the path of truth. Father, during this time, I pray that you deal with hearts through your Holy Spirit and that we'll leave this place ready to take a stand on the ultimate truth, which is you and your word. We ask it in Christ's name. I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. Altars are open.